Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Larry Park Show. I'm Larry Park, and we're very, very honored this evening to have with us the Honorable Joe Diaguati, the only practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the Congress. Joe is the author of a sensational book. It's called Unaccountable, Acc Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Go to the next slide, please, so people can see a flash screen of this book. Let's go to that next slide, please. There we go. That's what it looks like. It's Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. And Joe formed a group while he was in the Congress. It's called Truth in Government. Joe, uh, again, thank you so much for coming on the program. My pleasure, Larry. Tell us, in your perspective of the bailout that just voted by the Senate last night, is that enough or is there more to do? But before you, you tell us that, uh, flash up the next slide, please. This is a slide that shows the amount of money that's been allocated to the bailout. Uh, it's roughly a trillion dollars. Can we see that next slide, please? There you go. And it shows the new authority to tr purchase trouble assets, $700 billion, the AIG bailout, $85 billion, Bear Stearns, $30 billion, uh, Fannie and Freddie Mac, $25 billion. That's what they think it's going to cost. They've really allocated $100 billion each. So let me go back to Joe. Come back to me. And Joe, tell us again what your perspective is on this. Well, it's really a quick fix, uh, but it's something that we have to do because of the liquidity problems. The grease in the system is money. If banks start, stop lending to each other, and they did that for a while, they even increased the interest rates tremendously for that, uh, then normal economic activity can cease. Uh, you have small businesses that need loans for operating expenses. You have people that still want to buy houses. Uh, you have students that need student loans. Uh, without liquidity, economic activity in America slows down dramatically and you know one thing leads to the other and psychologically a recession could get very deep I don't know that we'd ever go into a, 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 a depression with all the new things we've developed since 1930 but anything's possible I think we're in uncharted waters so the bailout is something that was absolutely necessary uh, I was listening to an interview last night with Warren Buffett uh, on the Charlie Rose show and uh, obviously he concluded the same thing. Uh, it's not something that many people are happier with. You, you have both sides of the aisle on Congress. You have people on the far left, people on the far right that don't like it as a solution uh, for different reasons. Uh, the people who are on the right are saying it's too much government intervention and that we need to let the markets work. Now, as Warren Buffett said, you know, we had free markets and what did free markets give us? In the old days, they gave us tulips that you could buy for thousands of dollars each. So free markets are not really free. They need some kind of uh, regulation, oversight, uh, but by the same token, you don't want to stifle economic activity. So I would tell you that what we have now is absolutely necessary. It's a shame that we saw some pork being added. I don't know who could have the, ner have the nerve to put something on there to give an incentive or a tax incentive for people making wooden arrows for kids, but somehow that crept in with a few other things. But it shows you that uh, either someone feels they're very safe, but that could be the next bridge to nowhere where we get up tomorrow morning and people figure out why they did it. So let's hope the Senate does vote for it, but basically it's only the beginning because the real bailout has yet to come. It's the national debt of the United States of America. And I think as we get into the program, you're probably going to ask me questions about that. I, I am indeed. 
Uh, I didn't realize it before you came on the program, but this is something we disagree about with this bailout. And basically, my view is that the whole system is dishonest, and no amount of regulation is going to cure that defect. Uh, taking bad assets off the balance sheets of the banks and putting them on the uh, uh, balance sheet of the government, I don't know that that's going to really well, do it. Well, this is a good point. And the key there is, how are we going to value those things? Uh, and again, smart people would tell you that when the Treasury buys those mortgages, they should be buying them at fair value. In other words, they shouldn't be paying face value for assets that have already been devalued because we know we're not going to collect. And that's a key issue. And, and you raise a very good point. If Mr. Paulson goes about it the right way and says, okay, bank number one, bank number two, investment bank number one, we're going to take these troubled assets from you, but we can't stick the taxpayer with what we already know is bad. So let's give you some money now for those assets, and we'll take the risk of collecting them, and hopefully we'll get our money back. If they do it that way, we will get our money back. Well, that... But if they try to give them face value, that's not correct. Well, that's what Bernanke said. He wants to give them face value. Well, that, that would not be correct. That would it, be it, it, and the whole thing digging a hole correct. to begin with. None of this is correct, but that's the plan. I mean, uh, they're not marking this to market now. There's just something in the news today. They want to allow the bank executives, in their judgment, to say how much this stuff is worth. And you know their judgment is going to overvalue them. Plus, these assets are continuing to decrease. I would hope but, that they, they would use some objective evidence and not the people we're well, buying them from. As you know better than most from your uh, time in government, uh, it's very unusual for these folks to do the right thing when it comes to accounting. Now, Joe, um, another thing that's really uh, very admirable about you, let's go to the next slide, please, while I ask this, Joe this question. This is a, a photograph of uh, uh, Joe getting off an airplane, and he's holding a credit card uh, in his hand. Come back to me, please. Joe, why do they, why do they call uh, you the congressman's, uh, or why do you call a congressman's voting card the most expensive credit card in the world? What is that well, about? Actually, I brought my old voting card with me, <laughs> oh, and that's the one that you see there. Uh, one day, Commerce Magazine called me when they heard that I had given an interview at Fortune, and they showed this, and said, when you land in Westchester from Washington, can we come out and see you and take a picture of that credit card? your voting card, which you call the most expensive credit card in the world. Well, one day when I was voting, and don't forget, maybe you don't know, maybe people don't know that we vote with this card. At the end of a row of seats, there's a computer terminal. You put it in, and you press a button, yes, and that's a red light, a green light by your name, no, a red light, or present, an orange light. And it dawned on me that every time we put this card in, and this was back in the late 80s, we're raising the national debt because we're increasing the deficit because we were spending more than we were taking in. So obviously, this is an unlimited credit card. The one you have, if you decided to go beyond the limit, you would get a call. You would have to adjust your standard of living. You would have to defer a vacation. Not with this card. They keep raising the debt limit. And as you can see, for this bailout now, they're going to have to raise the debt limit to over $10 trillion. And that's right now the bonded national debt of the United States of America. I'm about to tell you that the real national debt is well over $50 trillion when you consider the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare. And I'm not the only one saying that these days. And of course, I, I know you agree with this, this business of this unlimited credit card, that's not something that's authorized by the Constitution. No, it probably is not. I don't think the Constitution could have ever envisioned what's going on today. And that's why on the cover of my book, Unaccountable Congress, I put a version of this credit card. I said, here's a congressional credit card, and I said, credit line unlimited, expiration day never, date never, built to future generations. And that's basically what's going on here. We are disguising the real cost of government, and we're passing it on to the next generation. And I don't think that's fair, because that means we're raising taxes dramatically on the next generation for our excess consumption today. Actually, in my view, Joe, uh it's our generation that's going to pay the bill. Well, and the way we're going to pay it... We're already is, beginning to pay the bill. No, we're not going to pay it through taxes. We're going to pay it through the, through the depreciation of our savings, the depreciation of money that's been promised to us for future payments, such as our Social Security, annuities, yes. anything that we have saved. Well, this is a very good point, because since we don't have this cash on hand, 
And since we are already borrowing from the Chinese and the Japanese, I think we're up to a trillion dollars of our national debt. Actually, it's representing the accumulated trade deficit. Actually, it's uh, two plus trillion these days. Well, it's a big number. Since we don't have that money, and you're a monetarist, so I know you'll appreciate this, we're in effect inflating the currency because we're monetizing the debt. Exactly. And what we're doing is just printing paper. And you would probably say, as a monetarist and someone who appreciates gold, that if we were on the gold standard, this could not happen. Actually, and you'd be right. Actually, well, we, we don't push the gold standard here. We push uh, constitutional money, which is gold yeah. and silver is money. There's a little difference there. Yeah. Let me go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, from, from two publications. One slide back, please. Actually, one article from one, one publication. One slide back. This is uh, uh, something called management accounting. Another uh, uh, article talks about Congressman Joe DiAguardi. The U.S. government needs a chief financial officer. Tell us, come back to me, please. What is the main difference between government accounting and budgeting and what publicly traded companies are required to use? Well, Talk first on that article, the reason why I did that is when I got to Congress after 22 years in one of the world's largest accounting firms, I realized that we have an OMB director, we have a controller, uh, we have internal auditors, uh, we have a treasury secretary, but I didn't see a chief financial officer. And here we have 29 government agencies and departments. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if we had someone looking at the numbers, evaluating them more than just doing bookkeeping and shoveling numbers around? And that's what chief financial officers do. So I worked four years to get a bill passed, and it was passed a year after I left Congress, and President Bush, number one, signed it, sent me a nice letter. So we have people now, but they're not in the right place. I said in my bill that, that it should be an independent department or an independent agency, just like the um, uh, Controller General, uh, the GAO. But what they did is they put the CFO for these various agencies in the Treasury Department. I wrote an editorial that appeared in Washington right after that. That's like putting the fox in the chicken coop. But in any case, there is a big difference. The accounting system that the SEC imposes on the private sector, in other words, to protect shareholders of publicly traded companies is called the accrual basis of accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. You can't have an outside audit without an auditor giving you that kind of a clean opinion. But the government is using the cash basis, which is the same basis that you would use and I would use to do our checkbook. When we write a check, it's an expense. We don't record in our checkbooks that we owe something to someone. So basically, we're on a system that's illegal. And the reason it's illegal is that we've had two Hoover commissions in the early 50s that recommended the proper accounting method, the accrual basis. And Pre President Truman signed after the first Hoover commission, and President Eisenhower signed after the second, and gave the Congress five years to implement the accrual basis. They never did it. They're staying on the cash basis because it's the best way to disguise the cost of government. And what are some of the differences? The big difference is we're able to commit things to the future, like Social Security, pensions, a lot of different things, but we don't record it on the books of account. We're figuring that someone, on, someone later on, on someone else's watch, has got to raise that money to pay for it. Worse than that, on Social Security, we already collected $2 trillion, because since 1980, there have been surpluses in the payroll tax. But we took that money under the unified budget and spent it on other programs. So not only do we have liability that's far in excess of that for the people who are living today that want to collect Social Security, and by the way, those are the baby boomers that are going to be asking for their money in the next five or 10 years. We have to find that $2 trillion we took from the Social Security tax fund and used in the general fund and somehow put it back. This is going to be a big burden on the next generation. If we were on the right accounting system, we would see it. Right now, you don't see it. It's like the iceberg. You only see the tip of it, the cash basis, the real liabilities are hidden below the surface. Now, you and I are on the, on the exact same page on this one. Uh, I would use stronger language. I wouldn't say disguise. I'd say the fraud. In which, effect, which, which is really what a fraud well, is. I mean, it is securities fraud. Think about it. If you were on the board of a publicly traded company and you used the system that the United States uses, you would be indicted for securities fraud and probably convicted. Now, you might say, well, what does the government have to do with securities? Well, guess what? The United States government is the largest issuer of securities in the world. 
treasury bills, treasury bonds, uh, you name it, all kinds of notes. And yet, you don't see a risk assessment. You don't see a financial statement that has a, an outside audit. And because they're able they're to do it. they're disguising. It's like you said, they have a fraudulent system. So we have a double standard. Yeah. And I think if the SEC is going to impose the right accounting system on the private sector to protect <laughs> shareholders, what are we going to do, or why don't we do the same thing to protect the taxpayers? <laughs> For my uh, next question to Joe, I want to put up a couple of slides uh, in, uh, just before I ask him. Let's go to that next slide, please. This is the one that shows the United States surplus government deficit on a cash basis. This is the way the government reports um, uh, de surpluses and deficits to us now. And you can see for the last couple of years, it's been running negative about $200 billion deficits. <clears throat> and go to the next slide, please. And this is a uh, slide that shows the unfunded retiree benefits at roughly $41 trillion. These are promises that the government has made to the people. Come back to me, please. Joe, you've written that the federal government needs a capital budget. Why? Well, a capital budget is something that every corporation who sells shares to, to, to individuals has. Uh, they, they know what their operating expenses are and they know what assets they have to replace in order to keep the operations going. Next year, our budget is going to be $3 trillion. Approximately $500 billion of that $3 trillion is going to be spent on things that you can qualify as assets, real hard assets. It could be an aircraft carrier for a billion dollars. It could be a government building. It could be a bridge. It could be a road. Right now, under the current accounting system and budgeting system, that's written off as part of the deficit. So in one way, the deficits would be less. Obviously, you have to show then depreciation, which we don't show. But why is this important? It's important, number one, because with the problems we have in our economy today, this is probably the fastest way to create jobs. A great Democrat, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, did this in the 30s. A great Republican, Eisenhower, did it in the 50s in building the, rebuilding the infrastructure of America. We should immediately do the same thing. We saw the bridge crumbling in Minneapolis last year. Uh, I read a story that there's over 500 bridges that are deficient. Now, what about the roads that are crumbling? What about other things? These things can be replaced immediately, and there should be no problem in that kind of spending because we should put those on the books as an asset. We don't do that right now. They're part of that deficit. And then you can depreciate them over the life of the asset, and you could pay them off over the life of the asset. Why is this just? Because then you're allocating the cost of government over the right generations. And that's what good accounting does. It seeks to match your income with your revenues, and it seeks to allocate the cost of capital items over the period for which they're used, and hopefully it will be paid by those people that are using them. So we need that. That's one thing. But although that might reduce the deficit, what would increase the deficit dramatically, offsetting that, are all these liabilities that we don't record. And let me give you some, uh, for instance. We have student loans. We have farm loans. We have the uh, subprime mortgages that we've seen. You had the FHA. Uh, you have the Fannie Mae and the Freddie Mac. You have the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. In fact, you have 29, 28 government-sponsored enterprises, GSEs. You know what these are like? What Enron got in trouble for the special purpose entities, these are all off the books, and yet they can bind the federal government by floating bonds. In my book, on page 47, in 1992, when I wrote that book, I predicted that we would probably have a bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because of this kind of accounting. And that just followed up on the SNL crisis. So the point is, when you look at these liabilities, and why would they be a liability if the government lends things? Because a bank would have to evaluate at the end of the year whether or not it's going to collect all those loans. The government doesn't do that. And we know that there's a loss experience here. All the students don't pay loans. The farmers don't pay all their loans. So you'd have to write that down annually. No, we don't do that in government. We wait until there is an emergency, and then it's called a bailout, and then they have to raise the cash. But it never gets on the books, but yet it gets added to the national debt. Outrageous. This is no way to run America. Outrageous. <clears throat> Uh, in preparation for, for the next question I want to ask you, let's put up the next slide, please. This shows the United States government debt to date. Uh, uh, the last, last I looked, it was something like $9.2 trillion. 
I heard just a couple of days ago that it uh, topped uh, $10 trillion, $10 trillion. And by the way, folks, this is debt that can never be repaid. And uh, these days, there's even a question whether it will be serviced properly. But that's uh, fraudulent debt. Uh, come back to me, please. Well, Joe, what, what is truth in government? And how are you using it to get your message of fiscal responsibility across to the people? Well, talking about that national debt is a very important way of telling the truth about what's going on in America. Uh, let's look at that $10 trillion you, you just mentioned. It'll be $10 trillion with this bailout. It was $9.3 trillion. This bailout will now put it over $10 trillion. That means the debt limit will have to be raised because the Treasury can't spend a dime or sell a bond until the debt limit is raised. Now, what is that comprised of? Believe it or not, that is comprised of about $4 million in bonds being held by U.S. entities and individuals, people who have decided that our Treasury bills are a safe haven. And you know many people put their money at the Treasury bills because they were afraid of what would happen if they did anything else. Well, there's four to five—I don't know the exact number—between four to five trillion dollars of that. There's another four trillion that's not in the public's hands, but these are IOUs that were put in the Social Security Fund because we have taken money out of that fund, and there are other things that we owe, uh, and that basically comes to about four trillion dollars that is an IOU well, but, well, to the future generation. Well, and then there's another trillion that we owe China and Japan. These are in round numbers. But that is nothing compared to the real obligations of the United States of America. Even the, the former Controller General, David Walker, Walker, who is a partner of mine at Arthur Anderson, uh, who just retired early to take a job with Pete Peterson, they just did a big ad in the, in the New York Times, Section A, middle section, you can imagine what that cost. And one of the first things they said is that the unrecorded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare alone and military pensions is $53 trillion. So besides this $10 trillion that we've bonded, we have unbonded debt and unrecorded debt and unfunded debt of at least another $50 trillion, which is going to be a big surprise to the next generation. Well, and why is this a problem, especially in Social Security? Because years ago, you had many, many more people working than retired. Right now, you've got somewhere between two and three people working for everyone that's retired, and that number is becoming increasingly less as the baby boomers go out of the workforce and now want their Social Security. How are we going to pay for this? Borrow more money from the Chinese? Raise taxes on the next generation? Who's thinking about this? You know, you know Joe... Uh, and by the way, we have a subprime national debt. And I should say it right here. Our national debt of the United States of America is subprime. Why? There's no collateral for any of it. You know, just listening to you, everything you're talking about is so overwhelming. I mean, it makes my head spin. I'm sure the people watching this show makes, makes their heads spin. Well, that's why they have to read the book, and I hope they uh, call for a copy. I wrote, wrote it in very simple English. Each chapter is separate. You can read it like Reader's Digest. I put very exciting titles like the one on Social Security is Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids the Bill. It's a Ponzi scheme. We, we raise money from some to pay others. And that's basically what Social Security has become. Let's, let's go to our, our next topic. Let's put up the uh, next slide, please. This shows the uh, number of restatements, uh, financial restatements, filed by United States and foreign companies that are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And as you can see, if you go back to around 1978, when someone got certified statements from their accountants, uh, it was pretty much psychosych. It would have been a, a scandal for a company to have to restate its earnings. And the last numbers I have, which were the year 2006, there were 1,800 restatements. Makes one wonder what the value of accounting is in America if major companies like uh, General Motors and General Electric and Fannie and whatever have to issue new statements and makeovers. Let's come back to me, please. Joe, uh, mark-to-market accounting rules played a role in the recent crisis on Wall Street and, in part, caused the demise of Lehman Brothers and AIG. Will you explain this? What, what, what's this right. about? How can it be corrected? Well, when you have a marketable security, it's easy to mark to market. You look at the stock indexes and, 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 and you're required to do that. These rules were applied to these subprime mortgages. And, and maybe we didn't understand that the markets would not be as easily to value as, as they, they should have been. So as a result, 
the rule as applied uh, from public accountants, certified public accountants, would require a company like Lehman to write down their holdings in these questionable mortgages and securities with these questionable mor mortgages that have been put in as collateral to the market. Problem is that there wasn't a really good market and they were forced, in many cases, to write them down too much. And now other companies are faced with the same thing. I understand that part of the bill is to suspend or at least to, to adjust that so that there'd be a much better application in, in this kind of a marketplace and for these assets so that you don't artificially reduce the value uh, too much and force a lot of other people uh, to see this as a ever sliding abyss, you know, which it's been. Now, mark to market is good. The problem is that we don't know what these assets are worth right now. In some cases, there is no market for some of these securities, and that's why it had to change. But you raised the restatement issue. Is it interesting that you've had many of these restatements since Sarbanes-Oxley has been uh, passed? And many people are saying this is an undue burden. In some cases, it may be for smaller companies. But bigger companies need independent directors. I'm on the boards of some companies. And certainly on the audit committee, I think you need a certified public accountant to be the chairman of that. In many cases, these companies find out that they did something wrong in the past. In some cases, the auditors kind of find out, but where there's a material misstatement, they are obligated to go back and restate. And if they don't, they could be subject to fraud and indicted for such. So you've had a lot of this. And, and why is this happening? Well, after Enron, everybody's looking for what's off the books. And believe me, there are companies that want to put their debt in other entities that they say they don't control. Like banks. And the same thing with, with, with losses. Like banks. And then they find out that basically they do control them or there's a good reason for them to be back on the books. And there may be other reasons, but in my mind, that's a good sign that the accountants are watching, that the independent uh, directors are watching, and they're not allowing people to, or, or companies, to go forward without restating to the right method. Now, a question that can be raised is, when you restate these earnings, do we get back the bonuses? The no, large bonuses not, that were paid nothing, to nothing. the offices like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Got, we they, just had a restatement. The, and, and the people who left there... They got $3 million back from Frank Reins. Did they? Yeah. That's all? Out of, but, out of $100 million almost. Well, I don't know what the number was, but there was someone else that left, I forget his name, with a big uh, golden parachute. And, and a lot of it was based on bonuses that were based on accounting systems and adjustments they had created in oh. order to level earnings. Phony accounting. Joe, exactly. we've come right to the end of our program. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Let's go to that last slide, please. Can we have that up, please? There we go. I just want people to notice the address of Joe's uh, Truth in Government organization. And again, if you write him a letter, uh, he will send you a copy of the book uh, uh, at no charge whatsoever. Come back to me, please. So Joe, thank, thank you so much again for coming on the show. It's a real honor and pleasure to have you with us. And folks, thank you very much, much again for taking the time to watch The Larry Parks Show. I'm Larry Parks, and I hope you'll tune in again next week. And thank you very much, and God bless, and good night. Thank you.